What I want to try and convey to you this evening is the immense importance to us individually and to us collectively of realizing what God's eternal purpose is in Christ and how it affects us. We think so much about our own local circumstances that we often forget the big picture. Now, going through difficulties and trials, we often turn to verses like uh, Romans chapter 8, where we read that, uh, I reckon that these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I'm afraid we kind of read over that verse. We might even memorize it, but we don't stop to think about how profound that is. What actually is the glory that's going to be revealed in us? So I'm focusing on the chart. You'll see that at the very beginning, there's eternity and an internal purpose. God, in eternity past, established a plan. Not just a plan for you individually, or me individually. He did that, but he established an entire scope of operations which culminate here, in a new heaven and new earth, eternity. The new Jerusalem, Christ and his bride, is established and, and populated when we go to heaven, but it continues on. But there's something else that God is doing. He's taking this creation, this natural creation, which we have between the blue ball on the left and the blue and the uh, and eternity on the right. He's taking that natural creation and he's using it as the foundation for a new creation. And I think you've all heard, if any man be in Christ, it is new creation. That's fundamental. That's a spiritual change. We have been born again. And I want to give a verse right now in my introduction that I'm going to refer to later. But it's Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And in that verse, it says something which is incredibly profound and important. That we are made partakers of the divine nature. How is it possible? You see, we can't have real fellowship with God unless we are morally like him. We have been separated from him by our sins, and the work of Christ on the cross, which is central in the chart, brings us back into a spiritual condition in which we can have fellowship with the eternal God who is absolutely holy. But more than that, we have been brought into a new creation where that is going to be standard operations. And that's what eternity is all about. It's new creation. That's really what new creation implies. There's a phrase, Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 15, where he speaks about Christ as being the last Adam. Now, we know Adam, and we're all children of Adam, and that's why we're sinners. But Christ is the last Adam. He is head of a new creation. And if you are in that new creation, you are offspring, in a sense, of Christ. And we are like him. We know that we're going to be made like him when we get our new bodies. Paul tells us that. So we're like him now, in part, but we're going to be transformed. This is what new creation is all about. And so what God is doing now is bringing us into an entirely new circumstance. But here's the bottom line of my talk. This is not something that he did as a consequence of Adam's fall. Adam's fall was necessary so that we could be redeemed. But what does that mean? In John 12, 24, we read, that verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, what? It abides alone. 
And that word accept is very important. Accept the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. There is the last Adam. He is a quickening spirit, Paul tells us. And so we are under in a new creation of which Christ is the head. Acts 2, 24. I'm going to add the word Jesus. Actually, it's just him that refers to Jesus given up by the eternal counsels of God, foreknowledge, by foreknowledge and eternal counsels of God. The Son of God volunteered wholly on his own to come and suffer as our Redeemer that he might have fellows. So God's eternal purpose is centered on making his glory known in Christ. And it is realized in the new creation, a spiritual creation. And there's some verses for you. So God's eternal purpose is to make a people for himself in the new creation, headed up by Christ as the last Adam. But this means there must also be a first Adam. This is we were quoting a minute ago. And this requires the work that goes on between the first day and the end of the sixth day. And we're going to look at this. But the point is that Genesis tells us, gives us a pattern of the work that God is doing. So this is accomplished through resurrection. In the verse I just quoted, John 12, 24. A necessary order. What comes first? 1 Corinthians 15, 46. That which is spiritual is not first, but that which is natural. There had to be a natural creation. This was necessary. You might ask yourself, why did God let Satan into the Garden of Eden in the first place? God could have prevented Satan from going into the Garden of Eden, but he didn't. But he had a plan. He had something better than Adam on his worksheet. The beginning of the natural creation. There's some verses that talks about that. And the end of the natural creation First Peter, and there's some verses to look at that. So all that's between the chart, and I've drawn a little diagram here. All that's in here is God deliberately and carefully working out his plan to bring us into new creation. That involves, we normally think of this chart as talking about the trial of man, and that's true. That's a fundamental part. Because man had to be proved, the first Adam had to be proved utterly worthless before the second Adam could take his place, excuse me, this last Adam could take his place as the object of God's delight. This work is accomplished in an orderly progression of ages. Now, can we get some help? I mean, we expect we have this chart. Where did it come from? How do we know it's even right, right at all? We get help from Isaiah. Now, this is Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Why does Isaiah at this point tell us something fundamental about Genesis 1? We're going to see that this is very important, this verse. There's a good reason for this. Israel was about to be taken captive. They had come to a climax in their history. God had chosen them, settled them in the land, blessed them. They built a temple and everything was going great. Well, they weren't very faithful, and God had to discipline them. And the discipline, you know, for their failure was that they would be taken captive by the king Nebuchadnezzar and taken to Babylon. What were they to think? You know, if you read through Jeremiah, we've been studying Jeremiah in our Bible studies in Portland, and what's interesting about them is the persistence that they had in believing that they could depend on the temple to save them as if the temple were some sort of a good luck charm. And they did this before with the ark, didn't they? With the Philistine. They said, oh, we'll bring the ark into the camp and that'll save us. Well, the Philistines overrun them, took the ark captive. So this is a very important lesson that they had to learn and we have to learn. Pretense doesn't hold any water with God. There has to be reality. And no matter how good we happen to be in in our, our meetings or in a church, whatever, in 
carrying out the ritual and the language of Christianity. God demands reality in the heart. So they were taken captive. But what is God doing here? In this passage from Isaiah, he's giving them positive evidence that he is going to bring an end to their captivity and he's going to bring them back. So Israel is about to be taken captive into Babylon for their disobedience. It was essential that they know that God would not forget them. You see this in Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah 31 and 33. So Isaiah goes right back to the most fundamental promise contained in the very first words of Scripture. Genesis 1 shows in type the completion of God's eternal purpose in Christ. God proves that he's going to accomplish his purpose by telling us ahead of time what he's going to do. This is what he did for Israel here. And Isaiah, God actually through Isaiah, uses this as an analogy to Genesis 1 to show that in Genesis 1, he said the same thing. He said exactly what he was going to do. And that's what the chart is all about. That's the key to these lines. You see on the chart coming out of chaotic. I don't like the word chaotic. I might give you another word later on. But you'll see that each line comes out of chaotic and it's like day one. And it points to a different period of time in the chart. Think about this. On the very first page of your Bible, you have a map that tells you God's purposes from beginning to end. Let's look at that at this verse now with that kind of an introduction. Remember the former things of old. What's he talking about? The former things. He doesn't tell us one. Does go back to David? Uh, go back to Moses? Go back to Abraham? Not what it says. It says, the former things of old, for I am God, there's none else. I am God, and there is none like me. He's insisting on his own sovereign power and knowledge here. Declaring notice. Declaring the end from the beginning. When's the beginning? First word of your Bible. First verse in your Bible is the beginning. But he's declaring the end. You get that? He's declaring the end right there. He's declaring the end. Notice that line goes all the way back from the beginning. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, now here he's telling us why he's doing this, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Isn't that amazing? God reveals his plan very at the very beginning. I am God. There's none like me. He challenges the idols. He challenges the false prophets. You read these chapters. They're marvelous. Chapter 40 through 49 are all apologetic in character. It's God demanding an answer to those who would oppose him. Look at the ancient times right at the beginning. There I have declared all my purpose, even to the end. Why? So that you will know that I have purposed it, and I also will do it. You know, there's a very practical consequence of this. What's happening in your life? What's happening in my life? Are there disasters? Are there difficulties? Are there pleasant times? Whatever is happening in your life, good or bad, you're in God's hands. That's essential. If you're going to live a solid Christian life, you need to have a deep, deep sense of God's purpose working out his pleasure in your life. What I call a dispensational, this, so this is why some background, uh, I have not really given you any technical details, but that's my emotional, you might say, background to why I think this is a best fit dispensational structures that reveals the heart of God in a way that no other plan that I've ever seen does. This dispensational view did not come about overnight. It was developed uh, first of all, Mr. Darby laid out a rough plan. He recognized the distinction between Israel and the church, fundamental distinction. 
he roughed out some of the other parts. John Savage wrote an excellent book, Scroll of Time. He elaborated. He get almost what we've got here, but not quite. F.W. Grant contributed a great deal to what I'm saying. A.E. Booth is the one who actually went through and cleaned up the details and put together the, the chart. He took from all these people uh, details and put together the chart in its present form. Uh, this view shows the progress of God's work through successive ages to bring to completion the new creation which is brought out of the old. And that's an important point. We're all in the old creation right now. But God is working in our lives individually. He's working in the church. He's working in mankind as a, in general to bring about his purposes. Now I'm going to start my talk. Okay. The purpose of God declared from, declared from the very beginning. Outline of the ages. First of all, we need to realize the chapter breaks in our Bible are inconvenient, to say the least, sometimes. Genesis 1, I'm calling this Genesis 1, but what I really mean is Genesis 1-1 one, one through Genesis 2-3. If you read and just pay attention to what you're reading, you can see that that's actually a part. Uh, chapter 2 begins with the seventh day, which of course goes with the previous days. Each dispensation is a distinctive period in history. During each dispensation, God deals with man as under the first Adam, showing his failure and need of a redeemer. That's one aspect. And the other is that he's bringing out a people for himself. Thus, the chart shows a sequence of successive stages or dispensations. Each day of Genesis 1 represents a corresponding age. Now, what's fascinating about this is that work done on the days reflects the most salient features of the corresponding dispensation. Each dispensation has relationships to other dispensations. God's revelation is progressive. He never backs up, retracts. The fall was not an accident. God allowed it. He did not cause it. It was man's full responsibility to stay in the relationship to God that God had put him in, and any failure to do that was his own failure, and yet God overruled to make that a foundational point in bringing about his purposes. The typical interpretation of Genesis 1 is what I call the outline of the ages. The lines from the circle labeled chaotic to the dispensation show that each day is related to a corresponding dispensation, which is what I already said. Okay, we need to understand types, and this is very important. I think we all have heard people talk about types, but it's very important to have a good, solid understanding of what a type is. So let's start with Merriam-Webster. A type is a person or thing, as in the Old Testament, believed to foreshadow another, usually in the New Testament. Let's try the Apostle Paul. For this Melchizedek in Hebrews 7 well, this Melchizedek, and this is, then he gives a description of Melchizedek, assimilated, this is Darby's word, it means that it's kind of metaphorical or related to, assimilate to the Son of God. So Melchizedek was a real man. He met Abraham. But Paul in Hebrews uses that historical incident as a description of Christ. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Another example is Paul writing to the Corinthians. Now, this is very interesting, what Paul says here. And again, it's important that you read what Scripture says very carefully. Is God occupied about oxen? Paul asks that question. What is this? He's asking, do you guys know your Old Testament? You know why Moses wrote this way? You know, is God concerned about oxen? Well, of course he is, in the sense that the Lord Jesus tells us that uh, even the sparrow falls to the ground, that God knows about it, his Father knows about it. But that's not the point. The key here is that these things were not written simply to provide a historical record. And this is what we need to keep in mind. 
if we look at Melchizedek, the uh, passages in Genesis 14, there's three short verses, and the discussion is in Hebrews chapter 7. You really need to sit down and compare these two. What is said and what is not said is important, and you need to pay attention to that. Paul uses both of these in his discussion of what Melchizedek shows us. And the account in Genesis, and this is really interesting, is completely inadequate as history. He doesn't say where Melchizedek comes from. He doesn't say how extensive his kingdom is. He doesn't say what economic relationships that kingdom has with other nations. He doesn't say how big his army is. There's a, a huge list of things that a historian would want to know, which a historian would include in the description, and it's not there. Why? It's because God is not interested in the history of Melchizedek. He's interested in the picture, in giving us a picture of Christ. And he uses a small snippet of history to do that. That's important because types generally use certain parts of history to give us something far grander in perspective. So this is something we have to understand. There is a base text. There's a literal interpretation, and notice every, even though it's a, we call it a literal interpretation, it it's uses assumptions that we make in order to make sense. And then on top of the, of the text, and then on top of that, there is the typical understanding that we gain from reading the text. Any text, whether it's a newspaper, a textbook, or the Bible, requires interpretation. You'll sometimes hear people say, well, I don't interpret the Bible, I just take it for what it says. Nobody does that because you use a dictionary to find out what the meanings of the words are. And words have multiple meanings. You may have three or four meanings that are possible. So you use a dictionary, you examine the grammar, you bring about your own assumptions about the nature of the text. Is it poetry or is it uh, linear uh, historical writing? Uh, in the case of the Bible, the base text is divinely inspired. It's inerrant in its original form. The guidance of the Spirit of God is necessary, yet it cannot prevent human error. Our interpretations are our interpretations, and we bear responsibility for them. Okay, so we have literal interpretation, and then we look for the types on top. Now, here's a, re a remarkable, we're going to see some examples of this. It's important. Sometimes it's the literal history that can only be understood fully from the typical understanding. You're going to see some examples of that, but there's actually quite a lot of them when you start to think about it. And these generally come up in the form of contradictions. For example, David, when he uh, was setting up Mount Moriah, who was it that caused him to uh, number the people? You see there's a contradiction. There's two different places in Scripture. There's lots of interesting examples where it's understanding the point of the text, the typology of the text that's necessary for understanding even what the literal text is intended to convey. Okay, interpretations have to be globally consistent. Don't read into a text what's not there. Uh, be aware of your own interpretive assumptions. Be sensitive to the object and purpose of the text. Be aware of logical and global context. Do not forget the cultural and temporal context is very important. There's many passages in the Old Testament that sound ridiculous. They make no sense. And it's because we're importing into those texts, those texts, things that we know so well, we don't even think about them. So don't try and smuggle 21st century ideas into a 12th century BC text. You have to be aware that the Bible was written a long time ago. This is, some of these are so obvious that, you know, we just gloss right over them and we make assumptions and we say things, which if you stop and stop and think about them, wait, that doesn't make sense. So be careful. Rightly divide the word of truth. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide, but I want to point this out on the chart. Notice, you got a beginning, you have an end. Isn't that interesting? How many days are listed in uh, Genesis 1? Is that behind it? Seven, right? One extra. Isn't that interesting? 
Six days shalt thou labor. What does the Lord say? My father worketh hitherto, and I work. How about that? John God is telling us he's working for six days to bring about his his purposes. The seventh day is in Genesis 1 separated from the first six. That's where God works in the first six days. But there's three on this left side and three on the right side. Why is there divided? They're fundamentally different because the cross is in the middle. The cross brings us an end to Adam. Right? The end of the work of God as with man as man. You've got conscience, you, as we'll look at in a second. You've got, anyway, law and whatnot. God is taking up the natural man. But after that, we have the church. The church is composed only of believers. Tribulation is a special one. That's difficult. I'm not going to mince words about that. But the last one is Christ and his church over the natural world. Now notice, all of these are in the context of the natural man, but in the first case, it's man, God with the natural man. Think about Israel and the kings. They're both good kings and bad kings. God took up Israel as man with government to see if he could make something of it. The lesson for us ought to be weighed today because this is where many Christians are. They're still back on that side of the cross. Okay, key phrases and words. We need to pay attention to, and God said, I'll highlight these in the text as we go through them. Here's an important point. This has been debated upside and down. I've read a dozen Hebrew scholars on this, and they're all over the place. The problem is they're not paying attention. They're not aware of the typology that's involved. It's very clear. If you just simply look at the verse, and look at the types. Because in the first place, the expression is unique. It's not found anywhere else in Scripture. It's very close in Daniel 8, chapter 4, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 14. The Hebrew verb exists in the passage in Genesis 1. But notice, there's a dark part at the end of the first dispensation and a bright part at the beginning of the second. The point that God is trying to emphasize here and to impress on us is that every dispensation ends in failure. But God, at the beginning of every dispensation, introduces something new. He sheds new light on the situation. And so there's mourning. Okay, so what's going on in Genesis 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was waste and empty. Darkness won the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the first thing is that God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in the typology that we're looking at, this refers to all of his initial work. This is the initial stage of the physical creation. It represents the initial stage of the natural creation. What did he do? Well, he put everything in order and he created Adam. He said, okay, Adam, here's a beautiful place you can live. That was the beginning. Notice at the second verse, there's a change of view. The point of view changes, and that's extremely important because now on, the natural man is what's being discussed. It's the natural man that's the focus of what follows. It says typically the condition of creation, particularly mankind, after the fall. Okay, the earth is waste and empty. Here's where it starts to get really interesting. The second verse gives us the beginning of the work of God, the person of the Spirit of God. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and is the Spirit that gives life. The earth is waste and empty. The ruin of the natural man under Adam is complete. Notice, waste and empty. Now, 
I'm using a lot of New Testament references here, so I threw in a caveat here. Although it is the long after history, the condition of fallen man has proven, hence the New Testament references, God sees the real depth as shown here at the very beginning. God knew at immediately, well, he knew from eternity, the depth of the ruin of fallen man. Why did he go through all this trouble for 3,000 years? It's because we didn't. We did not know the depth of the ruin that Adam's fall brought and the weakness of the natural man in Adam. Not fallen man, but simply the natural man. You can go through this. The face of the deep. Man is in darkness, and that darkness is profound. The spirit is hovering or brooding over the face of the waters. No one comes unto me except the spirit draw him. God's redemptive. What's that last verse? God's redemptive work begins with mankind in a ruined condition. This condition sets the stage for the redemptive work pictured in the days that follow. Okay, light is introduced from the first uh, from the age of Noah. Excuse me, from Adam to Noah. Ends with a complete failure, as we've already mentioned. Sons of God intermarrying the daughters of men. Now, this is interesting because God established light at the beginning. He said, let there be light. He divided the light from the darkness. This represents to us the light of God in conscience, creation, and promise. And right at the very beginning, we have the difference between Abel and Cain. And it was Cain that killed Abel. Remember that. There's an antagonism toward the grace of God represented by Cain murdering Abel. But Seth comes along, and he's the, the line that we're talking about here. The witness for God against the witness for darkness, we might say. The light is divided from the darkness. But in the end of that dispensation, and this is the darkness, those who are responsible represented by the sons of God, those who are responsible to carry on the witness for God, intermarried the daughters of men, because they thought they were pretty. Think about the Apostle Paul and what he says in Corinthians. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Darkness and light. What's happening today in the church? Notice that light was not created at this point, just as Christ, the true light, pre-existed creation. All of these parallels, it's amazing. And it was good. Now, you want to notice, there's one day where God doesn't finish the day by saying it is good. Very interesting and significant. Everything in this chapter is significant with regard to the topic that we're looking at. God divided. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 is the one I was referring to. Take a look at that verse. Failure, separation, God called. The night in darkness is labeled. Woe unto them, by contrast, woe unto them who call evil good and good evil. How much we have of that today. God divided between good and evil, the light and the darkness. Now the water is separated. God said, let there be an expanse, and so on. The second age is from Noah to Adam, and here the sword is given unto man. Government is established. Notice, waters above and waters below, the same material. And one is above, an easy figure for rule or for authority. But it's the same material. How is that going to work? Well, we need government. God authorizes government. Even in the New Testament, in Romans 14, we're told that we obey the powers that be because they're ordained of God. God sees that it's necessary to have human government. And yet we know how badly that government has fared. Typical of man gathered, then some verses, waters above and waters below. God established the division. Government is of God, and God names the expanse. Look at Daniel 4.32. God not only established government, he establishes the governors. Notice, not said it was good. Why? This is the only period where what's typified does not carry forward into the new heaven and new earth. 
Isn't that interesting? Every other day has something of permanent value. Human government is for this world only, the natural creation. Dryland plant, well, you can guess that's Israel and the fruit that that nation would bring. There are two distinct parts of this day, as I've highlighted there. That's important. Uh, separation between the, the seas and the lands. We know that the seas are typical of the nation, especially the Gentile nations in their disorder. God separated out when he called Abram, Abraham. Notice it's good. The nation Israel carries forward in the new creation. Dry land and plants, each of these have a significance. Now, this is my favorite. This is the present dispensation. And it's amazing how well all of these parallels carry through. Let there be lights in the expanse. So God determined that there would be a son coming to give light to the world and that he would have a church, as we would say, a bride. Now, the chart comes just before this. Why isn't, excuse me, the cross. Why is the cross not in the day, mentioned in the days? You know, we're going through the days, and I quoted all the verses, right? Right? I'm using Darby's translation. I, but the cross, where, where does the cross come? Why is that? Well, here's my thought. It's shown on the chart as central, not explicitly mentioned in the types we are considering, because it really is the end of the previous age, as well as the ground of all the ages that follow. So, if you look at the chart, you'll see that the cross really comes at the end, and then there's the Mount of Olives. So it's very special. It's really the culmination, the cross, and this is the point, the cross is the culmination of God's work with man as man. That's a serious thing to think about. And Paul tells us, the old man, Romans chapter 6, the old man is crucified. The cross is a penal act. The Lord Jesus was put on a cross because he was accounted as a criminal. So that tells us what God says about the old man. We're talking about Adam. All, all, every one of us, as a child of Adam, we come under the curse of the cross. And Christ has taken that curse, and we go free. That's the gospel. But what is involved in that is truly wonderful. Implicitly, it is shown in the glory of the Son in the next dispensation. For it is the Son of God that gives the glory to the cross. Notice on the cross, it's dark on the left side and it's bright, bright yellow on the right side. That's what it says about man. It's also what it says about Christ. Consequently, it is implied in all that follows, particularly in the glory of this age in the sun, moon, and stars. In the heavens. I'm taking these phrases right from the verses. In the heavens. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about objects in the heavens. How often... Paul talks about that. The church is heavenly. You and I individually, we are heavenly in character. And the church has largely lost sight of that. And he divides between the night and the day. We are to be for a witness, Ephesians 2.10, for signs and seasons. We are to reflect the signs of the time. Who talks about the rapture or the coming of the Lord except those who are believers? You won't find that among the Mohammedans. You won't find that among the uh, Hindus. Lights in the heavens. We are heaven and we give light to the earth, to give light to the earth. Notice how marvelous these, these parallels are. God made or appointed two great lights. These were in God's thought. Notice the wording. He doesn't create these lights. Even in the, in the literal text, these lights are not created. They're made to shine. They're made visible. And Christ and the church, in God's thoughts, were from eternity. You find that in Ephesians. The great light is Christ. I am the light of the world. The small light is the church, the pillar in the ground of truth, to separate and divide, as in these verses I've given you. 
God made two great lights, a great to rule the day, a small to rule the light. I like the stars. Ye are the light of the world. Individually, we are the stars. But you know, it's an interesting, sometimes we can learn some things from nature. We learn from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 41, stars differ from star and glory. There are blue stars, large, hot, blue, fast burning. Uh, there are yellow stars like our sun, medium, medium, and uh, medium large, medium hot, uh, yellow, and there are medium fast burning. By the way, our sun is really unique. It's very stable. And even stars that are outwardly similar to our star are not as stable as our sun. We could not live here on earth without a special star as our star. There are red stars. All these kinds of stars are visible in Orion. You know what I'm talking about. Orion's mentioned in the Bible. In Orion, you can see up there in the sky. And so next time you look up, up at Orion, you can all spot a line from the Orion because of the three stars in the belt. Think of the various talents and abilities because Orion has all three types of stars. You look up at Orion, the belt goes this way, his right shoulder is up here, that's Betelgeuse, that's a red giant, noticeably red, even to the naked eye. You have the belt, which are yellow stars, or white stars, and down on the right, his left foot, to our right, is Rigel, which is a blue star, noticeably blue. So you look up at Orion, and you meditate on the fact that all of us are different. We have different talents. We have shine with different colors, but everyone precious to the Lord. Now, I've got to get to the last day because that's the greatest. And this is what F.W. Grant says. This is a quote. So here's a quote from him. The fifth and six days are in some of their details most difficult to read. And yet, their general application is quite easy. Well, that may be. But this day is from rapture to the glorious appearing, and it will be an parallel trial. Now, this is a challenge because the day speaks of progress and creation, abundant creation. But when we read Revelation, what we think of is disaster, right? Judgment, horrible. Evil men. Here's the secret. God judges because he's trying to reach the conscience of mankind. But what is his real purpose? And this verse, these verses, the beginning of Revelation, tell us. Revelation chapter uh, 7, verse 3. Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the bondmen of our God upon their foreheads. These are people taken out of Israel who are specially saved. Now notice, this is prophetic, because at the beginning of tribulations, before any of the disasters happen, or it's the, the big ones, and God is marking out, he's saying, okay, there's going to be judgment, but I am going to preserve these people. That's a good God. He has to bring judgment because of his own righteousness and because he's trying to reach at all costs the heart of mankind. What's the result? Notice the next verse, 9 and 10. Here are the Gentiles. After these things I saw in law a great crowd, which no one could number, out of every nation and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palm branches in their hands, and they cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to God, our God, excuse me, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. These are saved out of the Gentiles. You can go read the chapter to get the context. What I want to call attention to is a great crowd which no one could number. Now, I would simply argue that that is what the text in Genesis regarding the fifth day is all about. It details for us the work of God in saving Jews and Gentiles for eternity. Now, what's really interesting, God saw that it was good. What does that tell us now, based on what we've already seen? It tells us that these are saved not just for eternity, but for the new earth. 
those who come through the tribulation, remember the Lord said, they that endure to the end shall be saved. Now that's often misrepresented. That's misunderstood by many Christians. What that verse tells us is that those that persevere through the tribulation, they're not martyred, they don't give up the faith, they persevere through the uh, tribulation, go into the millennium. And after a thousand years, when God judges the wicked at the end of the millennium, they go into the new earth. We don't know much about the new earth. But we do know that it's a blessed place. I'm not going to say anything more about uh, the monsters. Uh, some text here that gives you some of my ideas. Again, this is, a, like I said, a difficult part. It's the most difficult. Now, the Christ dominion over the fruit forest, there's lots that could be said about this, but I'll let you read my text. I think this is interesting. God made Adam and Eve in his image. Typically, that refers to the fact that we are in Christ, there is a new creation. Like I quoted from Peter earlier, we are made partakers of the divine nature, and he will transform our bodies of humiliation into conformity with his body of glory. And he will, we will reign over the earth. Adam and Eve were given dominion. He created the male and female. Now, then the text, you just kind of skip over that and say, well, duh, yeah, here I'm, I have my wife and I'm a male and she's a female. But how did he create her? And what does the typology tell us about our relationship to Christ? Isn't that where the profound truth comes out? He created the male and female. You know, we don't really appreciate what Christ thinks of us. We have dominion, universal rule, supervision of the prosperous earth. A bunch of verses there about blessing during the millennium. There's a bunch of argument about what this means. Very good. Very good for what purpose? Doesn't mean idyllic, but it means for a purpose. It was just what was needed. Now, God's day of rest. Notice, there's no evening and morning. There is no evening and no morning. Notice that the previous day says it's an evening and morning. The millennium has an evening. Look at this. See that right there? Fire from heaven to destroy the ungodly. Look, at the end of that millennium, even the Lord himself ruling over the children of Adam comes to a failure. I don't know what else tells us more about Adam's children than that. If the Lord himself in governmental rule over the children of Adam still ends in failure. I mean, globally, obviously nothing fails with God. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing fails with God, but I'm talking about out of man. So all of this takes us to the new heaven and new earth, where there's no evening and morning. There's no more change. There's not no more this one thing following another. You get the meaning there. There's no evening and morning. The heavens and earth are finished. Now, this is really interesting. Why does it say that they were finished on the seventh day? You know, naturally, this is another case. You know, evening and morning was one case. There's another case where the literal text fails to convey what's really going on here. The fact is that God has established on the seventh day the complete new creation. That's when it's complete. That's when, okay, right there. You know that, that red line going up. Those who are delivered during the millennium and all those that are toward the end of time go into the new heaven and new earth. So it's established then. How wonderful it is that God completes his work there. And uh, the text gives us that indication. Oh, yeah, God rested. Behold, the, I got to read this. Listen, 
Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall tabernacle with them. Get the power of that statement. God shall tabernacle with men. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Their God, and he shall wipe away everything. You know, we usually read the last part. Skip over the first, read the last part. Because that's what affects us, right? But the last part is dependent upon the first part. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall not exist anymore. No grief, no crying, nor distress, nor, so, nor distress shall exist anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he sat on the throne, said, "Behold, I make all things new." I make all things new. That's the completion of all the work on new creation. We are a new creation now, spiritually. And we will become complete in the rapture. We get a head start. The Old Testament saints, along with the church, we get a head start into the new creation. We go into the new Jerusalem. But that's not the end. God still has work to do. And so we go through the tribulation, the millennium, and then everything is complete. And Christ is glorified by bringing everything under his headship. I should say God is glorified by bringing everything under Christ's headship. The work isn't complete until we get here. And then we will see Christ exalted above all. And we will enjoy that association with him. Blessed and hallowed. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. All that we've talked about tells about how Christ from eternity was established by God to be the head of all creation. He is the beginning of the creation of God. Everything is under his control. By him were created all things, things in heaven, things in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, lordships, principalities, authorities, all things have been created by him and for him, and he is before all. And all things subsist together by him. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn among the dead, and that he might have the first place in all things. And always he will be the one who was given up by the determinate counsel of God in eternity. Have you ever wondered why the Lamb is so prominent in Revelation? The Lamb is mentioned 23 times in the book of Revelation. Isn't that amazing? God will never get tired of exalting his Son as the Redeemer, the work that he did on the cross.